Welcome to Spine Conference. Today we're going to go over how to read a cervical MRI. Uh, just a reminder, I record everything so it's uh, on the internet. So please keep everything G-rated. Um, this is, um, who's going to Preakness? Anybody? No? No. Preakness is in two weeks. I think I want to try to go to the Balloon Globe. Huh? I don't know that. It's great for kids. It's got a million, and for adults who like who like pretty things. There's a bunch of balloons everywhere. You can go up like 80 feet cool. in the balloon. Yeah, the kids uh, kids run around in the balloons. It's great fun. So uh, MRIs have been around um, say 20, was it 20, 30 years, and we use them constantly. At least I do. And they're, they're comprised, I'm just going to go over, just review MRIs briefly, but you can interrupt if you have any questions. They're comprised of magnets. So the Earth has a magnetic field, and the Earth's magnetic field is about, uh, say, 50 microtesla, which is very weak. Now, how strong is the MRI in the hospital? It could pick up a car. So the MRI in the hospital is 1.5 Tesla. That magnet is strong enough to pick up a car, like in the junkyard. And the MRI works by um, protons. And don't ask me why, but it has to be an odd proton. It can't be an even number proton. It's got to be an odd number proton. Don't ask me why. So the first odd numbered proton just happens to be hydrogen which we have a lot of so we're about 10 percent hydrogen it's too bad that the MRI process can't get even uh, protons because we would probably use oxygen but we use hydrogen and where do we have hydrogen? Well, in water right? so we are made up mostly of water yeah. 60 percent or so <laughs> and huh? Sobering thought. Sober, yeah. It's uh, kind of odd if you think about it. We have so much water. We're like a water bag, sort of. It's, it's bizarre. And what parts of our bodies have a lot of water? Well, our teeth don't have much water, 8 to 10%. That makes sense because it's mostly like a bone. But the blood is 80% water, which makes sense. Brain's 80% water. Lungs, 75% water. So most of our organs, a lot of our organs are made up of water. Now, the the protons are usually just, uh, in, in the state they are, they're not aligned in any way. The magnetic field just kind of irregular. So the way the MRI scan works is it's a massive magnet, and it, it aligns all the protons. And then, another, and then what happens is um, a uh, radio frequency is applied across the... Um, across the uh, protons like a pulse of energy and then that makes all the protons wobble and while they're wobbling and they're going back to their steady state they emit energy and that energy can be picked up the energy can be uh, picked up and then um, recreated with a computer and it gives off a certain um, amount of information so again you, got, you have a big magnet and then the radio frequency coil blasts some energy at usually 90 degrees, I believe, and it lets off energy, which is absorbed, tracked, reformatted, and then processed. And that's how we get the MRIs. It's quite incredible, actually. It's, it's an amazing human invention. And the, and the energy that's given off is radio waves, which is a very, very weak form of energy. Um, and the gamma rays are the highest form of energy that we have. And x-rays are really high. So that tells you that you don't want to get this energy in your body because then it causes problems with our DNA and we get cancer, etc. So the radio waves are very, very safe. And we're inundated by radio waves. And I don't think there's any risks. I mean, I don't think there's any risk to radio waves. Some people think maybe there is. But. And then when this energy is... Um, absorbed and calculated, each chemical has a characteristic pattern. 
And when I was in college, we used to study these patterns. Uh, NMR. This was like in the early '80s, and back then it was like a new science, and I, I loved it. We, you know, it would give us a pattern. They say, "What is this chemical structure?" We'd figure it out. So these these things are reformatted into like images, and and the MRI scans they give us sections. So a section is a slice of something. You know, on the left here, you can see the slice of a house that from the outside you don't really see. And then when you look at these slices, you can kind of recreate the whole house in your mind, sort of. Okay, in the attic, this is where they store things at the very top of the house. And then this is where people live in the middle, too. And the bottom is the basement, the storage. Middle-aged um, husband works out with a punching bag where there's no noise. Um, and then you get an understanding of the whole house that you wouldn't get from just looking on the outside. Same thing as the people. So we get these slices and we can understand the workings of, of the human person that we wouldn't understand, you know, on the outside. And you can, this, you know, same thing is for the body. So we get a fundamental understanding of these things like discs. And what's interesting and fascinating about medicine is that everybody's different. So we have tall people, we have short people, we have big people, we have small people, we have old people, we have young people, and there's a lot of variation. Now, to understand, to read an MRI, you also have to understand the shape of the spine. On the front view, the spine is straight, but on the side view, we have these, these gentle curves. In the cervical, good morning, the cervical spine, we have lordosis, thoracic spine kyphosis, lumbar spine lordosis. And this is a spinal canal, and this is where our nerves and spinal, come in. This is our nerves and spinal cord run. And these are axial sections of the average spinal canal. The frame and magnum, <coughs> today's topic is uh, cervical MRIs. The frame and magnum is very, very large, and there's a lot of neural tissue up there, the spinal cord. As it goes down, it thins down. At T1, it's round, but in the cervical spine, it's slightly triangular at C6, C4. And this is um, a study of uh, 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 many uh, MRIs. Oh, yeah, actually, if they were CAT scans. And just the mean anterior posterior diameter is around 14, and the transverse diameter is around 25. So that's why this, because of this information, it's hard to know what's normal. Like you said, what's, what's a normal spinal canal? <laughs> well, it's different for Minute Bowl and Spud Webb, the guy on the left, guy on the right, totally different. But we also, we have to understand what's a normal size, et cetera. So these ranges just give us an idea. So this is the MRI scan of a child. And almost always children have pretty normal anatomy because they just haven't been alive long enough, so they haven't really deteriorated much. And you can see this is a normal MRI. And the vertebral bodies are very, very square, no irregularities. The disc heights are all uniform and tall. And there's pretty good signal or T2 weighted images in all the discs. Spinal cord is in the spinal canal. And you see the spinal cord has plenty of room everywhere. On both in the front, anteriorly, you see CSF. Posteriorly, you see CSF. No malalignments. That's a totally normal MRI. And here's the axial cut of the same child. Uh, plenty of room for the spinal cord in the spinal canal. This is the frame in the hole where the nerves run. Plenty of room here. Vertebral arteries, totally normal. So, and if you have any questions, just interrupt me, okay? You know yeah. your pointer doesn't go up there. Oh, shoot, I, I forgot. Um, sorry about that. I don't know what to do. Um, just on the left, you see the spinal canal, the other holes, the foramen, the transversarium, the vertebral body. So within the spinal canal, you can see on the left, the spinal canal is just slightly triangular. This is probably like at C4, C5. And the spinal cord itself, um, is the uh, shape of a cylinder, a slightly flattened cylinder, I would describe it. Um, the bottom cartoon is a side view. You can see the facets where the joints are. And on the right is another MRI. Um, just the same anatomy. Uh, within you see the small hole is the uh, transverse frame and where the <coughs> body lives. 
the other interesting thing about the cervical spine is you can see the uncinate process on the on the top which is uh, sort of a, a cup shape that holds a one vertebra on top of the other and they kind of in my mind I like to watch football that's one of my favorite pastimes I think of it as a goal post so the uncinate process is kind of like a goal post and you can see it cups the one underneath it see how underneath it it's just a C shape so you can see they all stack up like that and the uncinate process there's good like everything in life there's a good and bad side to everything in life so the uncinate process is good because it gives stability to the spine. And you may say, well, what's bad? Well, the unsinate process is bad because as we get older, huh. it hypertrophies from uh, increased stress and then compresses the frame or you know, the hole where the nerve runs out. Huh. So this unsinate process becomes a problem. And you can see it here, and you can see it here, and it's hitting the framing. So although it gives uh, you know, stability, as we get older, it, it causes troubles. So, and the other thing you can see on the bottom left, the trans, the frame and transversarium, you can see the vertebral artery, uh, the um, the nerve root as it exits the foramen. So, any questions so far about um, anatomy? Aaron, want to add something? No. Okay, so let's. Let's just go over an MRI, and um, um, Aaron, can I ask you to point this up? <coughs> Do you mind? No. Nope. It's a good exercise. You'll like it. <laughs> so, Aaron, show show everybody uh, on the left one the spinal cord. So this is a 48 year old man. You can stand up. You can stand up. Yeah. No, you're all right. You see the spinal cord. Okay, and show the anterior longitudinal ligament in on the front of the anterior vertebral body. It's the anterior longitudinal ligament. Yeah, so that goes all the way up and down. Now that should be straight, right? Now, Aaron, on this man, he's a 48-year-old man. This man is a genius, actually. Of course, it's me. So, <laughs> this, <laughs> this uh, um, I, I figure I'll show myself because otherwise women never look at me. This is the only one way a woman will ever look at me. Uh, spine conference. So show in the front Aaron, anterior, uh, can you see any irregularities of the verbal body? This is a normal man with no symptoms. Are the bodies? The yeah, see that? Awesome. Yeah, you see that? So this is the very beginnings of anterior osteophytes uh, from early degenerative disc disease from the stress of just life. <coughs> but I mean, but I have seen cases of 90 year old people with absolutely normal MRIs. Absolutely normal. And I was so astounded that I spent 10 minutes just making sure that this was the right MRI. I was like, is this the right MRI? Are you sure? When did you get the MRI? I thought about it. So who, well, how can that be? Yeah. Can anybody give a theory? D don't you think that's impossible? It wasn't a gym instructor. <laughs> you said, so maybe a low demand individual? You think that's it? Like if you if you if you found in a garage a 90 year old car that was absolutely normal running condition, absolutely no, everything was normal. I wonder how it happened. Why? I mean, I have my own theory, but can anyone think of why? Why would that be? Perfect balance of use and not abuse. Yeah. So maybe a totally normal life. What else? Genetics. genetics. Just genetically predisposed to have absolutely nothing wrong with that person's spine. I mean, they have no no weaknesses in their genetic code. Or, what I, you know, the genetic, this is, I mean, I don't know, but my theory is the genetic code is a play of the environment with the genetic code that affects it. So, nothing affects this genetic code. It protects it from any viruses or disease processes, etc. <coughs> and, and a good life, I mean. So, I, I f firstly, I found that fascinating because you can't write everything off to old age. And also, you see very young people with very early problems. Um, How about occupation, too? I mean, what yeah. are you in for hours at a time doing your surgery? Your head I mean, I'm like two or three days a week, like 20 hours a week probably. But, I mean, I think being a spinal surgeon is a low demand, in the, uh, low demand um occupation I would think for the neck 
especially with the new microscopes. The microscopes are ergonomically designed that the head's straight. That's why everybody uses them. It's, it's, um, the young doctors, they can use the loops, but the old doctors love the microscope because your head is straight. It used to be with the loops, you have to bend your neck to look down. Okay, so any other, uh, Aaron, do you see any other abnormalities at all in this MRI? Show me the, uh, show me the, if you don't mind, right? It's kind of fun, right? Show me the uh, ligamentum flavum. Can you see the ligamentum flavum? Remember, it connects the lamina. Well, that's, yeah, that's where it lives, but now show me exactly where the ligamentum flavum, it connects from lamina to lamina. So show me the lamina, the posterior spinous process. You know where it is, posterior spinous process. See if it's close up. You can see it, it's like a little triangle. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Use the force. Don't be afraid. Just use it. Let it flow. And go from lamina to lamina. Where is it? From there to there. That black line. See it? Now point to it. Point to it well. From there, back there to there. That's the ligamental flavum. And that can hypertrophy in the patients. And you can see if the disc collapses in the front, that ligamental flavum will buckle and compress on the spinal cord. And we see that all the time. And the radiologists usually don't comment on it because, I don't know, Maybe it's boring. It's not. It's not like a tumor or something <coughs> that jumps out at people. But it causes stenosis. One more thing is what? What is? Um, what is it? What is this thing right here? What is that? What is that little fold? Is that thing? Hmm. How high are we? C three. Yeah, it's epiglottis. Nice, very nice MRI of it. <laughs> and it, and it's right at C3. <laughs> so it's a really important structure. Um, you can you can imagine the food. So why don't you sit down here? Okay. Uh, you can imagine the food going down the pharynx, and that little fold keeps us from aspirating, which is a, which is an amazing structure. <laughs> and it's also at C3, C4 where we know in spine surgery, that's when we do surgery at C3, C4, that's the highest incidence of dysphagia. So I'm not sure if it has to do with the fact that it's at the level of the pharynx or the epiglottis or the tongue. I think so, personally. And it somehow affects it. So let's, let's look at some more things now. So this is a parasagittal cut. And I can tell it's a parasagittal cut because I don't see posterior spinous processes here. And Aaron, can you uh, point out point out as many anatomical structures as you can for everybody? You can do it. You can do it. You're you're strong. On this side? Anywhere you want. So obviously the for vertebral bodies. The vertebral um, bodies, yeah. Here's this spinal, spinal cord. Any pressure on the spinal cord? Uh, no pressure, but there are some. Uh oh, what is it? Bulging discs. A little bit of bulging discs, which we didn't see in the child, right? Correct. Why are the discs bulging? Tell me which levels they are because you have to use levels so we can keep referring back to them. Three, four, four, five. Well, four, five, you mean, right? Three, four looks okay. Four, five, and five, six, yeah. mostly, right? So four, five, and five, six have some bulging disc. Why are they bulging? Degeneration. Yeah, and they're maybe getting decreased in height a bit. Now, do you see anything else wrong with the disc in the front? That would make sense as well. If it's a problem in the back, maybe a problem in the front as well. Remember what we said before the anterior? Uh, the uncle osteophytes. Well, the osteophytes anteriorly, yeah. Show the anterior osteophytes, the same levels. Yeah, yeah, you see how they're kind of uh, lipping? So this is a degenerative disc, and you can see it bulges out the front, which nobody cares about. There's nothing in the front uh, other than the esophagus. It has to be really big, <coughs> like the esophagus. But in the back, it's pressing up against the spinal cord. And like you said, in the frame, it will be compressing the nerve root, which is a problem. Okay, any other structures or? Yeah, here's the epiglottis, and uh, it's at rest. And this is this is a just so you know, this is a very good MRI. It's like <clears throat> it's the best one in Bel Air. That and they have good text. They do a really good job, and they they print them out very well. And also, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't I didn't have any serious pathology, so I, I was able to stay very very still and calm. But you can imagine when patients go into the scanner. It, it's really they can't do it. They just they, they have terrible radiculopathy or stenosis or they could have cancer. Who knows what? And it's really really hard to stay still. Those poor people are suffering. So it's sometimes it's very hard to get a good image. So all these things 
you have to think about it when you when you order an MRI and when you're looking at it. And the other thing is, it's a picture. It's a picture of of somebody laying flat and a complete rest. So it's kind of it, it's just a static shot. So if you like, for example, if you took my son and just took a picture of him, you would think he's an angel. He's a cute boy, smiling. But when you see him during the day, he's a madman. Nothing like the picture. So the, the way I look at it is just like an MRI. Like during the day, I don't look at anything like this. I mean, I'm screaming at Aaron. I'm running. I'm tr you know, trying to eat a uh, waffle. I'm, it's a constant motion. And, and your spinal cord and your discs are under constant motion. You can, like when you move, the spinal cord <coughs> may push up against those discs while it's moving because there's motion to the head. I mean, the spinal cord can move about a centimeter. So all these things, as a physician, you have to keep in your mind that these things, you know, it can cause problems. It may, even though the MRI looks great, when the patient's uh, motioning, you know, moving, it could be different. Uh, how about this, Aaron? What do you... Um, Show me the facets where the two uh, bones come together. Yeah, yeah. And um, how about can you find for extra credit the vertebral artery somewhere? The vertebral artery. Yeah, that's great. That's what just above. That's at C1, right? How can you find the vertebral artery at C2 as well? It makes it makes it like a 90 degree curve around there. That's C1. Go down to C2. Can you find a little circle? Go go down. That's not it. Remember, it's the anterior. In the front. Yeah, can you see it on this one? Yeah. It's right there. And the vertebral artery um, runs up and down there. Okay. And this is a great MRI. Um, this one, it's not too interesting. This one I found interesting is okay, I'm, I'm pointing to the facet, Aaron, and what makes what's this color above the facet? What why is it like light there? Why is it light there? Light color. What's the kind of bone is that? Cartilage. It's not cartilage. If we drill into the facet, remember sometimes we drill into the facet uh, into the lateral mass by accident when we do cervical surgeries where we're too lateral spongy and it starts bleeding yes. spongy bone. Yeah, cancellous bone. So cancellous bone lights up. Now just underneath it is really really black. See, it's really, really black. What's that really, really black line? That's cartilage, right? Nope, yeah. it's not cartilage. It's really hard. What's black on MRI? Totally black. Cortical bone. So that's, see how that's really, really black there? Yeah. That's cortical. It's really strong cortical bone. Remember from the beginning, does cortical bone have any um, hydrogen in it? Any water? No. Not too much. Yeah, not much at all. So that's why it's black on the MRI. Now, be, now, between the the two black lines, there is uh, some white white stuff. What could that be? Now we get our cartilage. What cartilage? Yeah. yeah. So it's just like the facet, and like any bones, there's cartilage, and sometimes it can really light up in the joint. And what's that when it's really bright? Motion. What's inside of joints sometimes? Fluid. Need fluid. Yeah. So so if it's a if it's a very arthritic joint. There could be fluid in it, and if it's a very arthritic facet joint, and these are normal, pretty pretty normal joints. But if it's a very arthritic joint, you can also get tannus. You can also get synovitis, which that lights up too. Okay. So I thought that was a very good example of of uh, that. And also, how about if you can find the cervical pedicle? Can you find the cervical pedicle? <coughs> right there. <coughs> That's the cervical pedicle, and you see the uh, lateral mass. So this, this whole thing is the lateral mass. Um, and, you know, for us, these things are interesting. These are difficult to read for me. Yeah, yeah, it takes, uh, it takes a super long time. Also, it takes a super long time to understand. And the other thing is, like, nobody, in, I, me personally, I think nobody enjoys looking at MRIs in great, great detail as a surgeon. Because oh that's that that's that so as a surgeon we're always trying to recreate things in our head. I think if you're if you if you're a true student of surgery you're always thinking about anatomy and where it is oh this is where it is that's where it is oh you can see this so that's great you can because during the surgery we're trying to find things all the time 
and if you can picture it in your mind that's that's the most powerful thing is you, is if you can picture something in your mind you know what it is you can understand it it's really hard to picture things in your mind though all right maybe we'll just keep going a little bit so this is normal anatomy so this uh, it shows the vertebral artery within the frame and and then can you see the angle Aaron at the very top at C, C1 and C2 you see how yeah see how it goes yeah it, it goes to C1 you remember we did that recent case at C1 I said you have to be very careful not to hit the vertebral artery laterally so now it makes sense from um, this in, this uh, this picture C1 and C2 you see the vertebral artery C2 and then it makes a 90 degree curve there at the top can you show that point that out again please the other the, the, yes see that oh lord yeah, so it makes a 90 degree. So you can see the artery. You can see it now. That makes sense. So I know this is a really small point, but we do surgeries in this area all the time, and it's really important not to hit the vertebral artery or the patient can get a stroke. What's the origin of the vertebral artery? I can't remember. I think it's a... No, I think it's a subclavian. Yes, correct. Subclavian. Okay. Subclavian. Uh -huh. Yeah. So... This is another, I found this, I found this is a really interesting cut because um, it has this big vessel here with a <coughs> lot of branches, Aaron. So what is that? A lot of branches, isn't it? And, and this is on the T, this is on the fat suppression uh, image, which shows water the best. The anterior spinal artery? Well, it's not this. It's not in the spinal canal, and so it can't right, be the right. anterior spinal artery. But it's um, wow, this is working now. It's a, it's a, uh, it's, uh, no. it's anterior, in the in yeah, the. Uh, anterior. What do you think, Aaron? This stuff. Now, how about during the surgery? Sometimes, and it looks like it's going into the uh, pedicle, into the pet, just below the pedicle in the foramen. So, just think, 24 hours ago. Remember when we found these big veins? Mm -hmm. These are veins within the foramen. So, so we have in the foramens we have these uh, very large veins, which are picked up with this uh, MRI scan, and they're in the um, they're about the uh, nerve root. Now, this is a fat suppression image, which um, which shows vessels, and the uh, the other thing I wanted to. Um, it can pick up these very, very small arterioles, which I can I think about it in surgery, Aaron. Sometimes when I cut the skin, we get this ar this arteri this this blood that spurts out three feet high. What is that? It's an arteriole, isn't it? And what is it doing there? Well, there's no. It's not a named. It's not. It's not a named vessel, but it certainly carries some blood, mm -hmm. and it just happens to be there. We ju we just have these random arterial vessels which feed our body I mean we need them and but they're not large enough to be named because the the variation is great so we, we can't really talk about them but they're present so you may say well who cares it's such a minor uh, detail who cares about that but what happens is sometimes these are arteries can be uh, can be injured during spinal surgery and they bleed into the spinal canal very very big problem so that's what happens sometimes and that's, that's, in my mind, that's where these come from, these very rare instances of arterial bleeds post-op or injuries to these uh, vessels that are undiagnosed during the surgery and then afterwards bleed. Because the vein won't bleed. The vein can only create so much pressure. I mean, the venous, what's the venous, like, uh, pressure? It's like nine, isn't it like nine millimeters mercury or something at the most? And um, so it can't really build up. But an artery can pump, you know, 100 millimeters of mercury, so it can really, really pump a lot of blood and cause a large hematoma. Okay, let me. Uh, <coughs> so these are just more uh, fat suppression images, and um, Aaron, what's this uh, line within the vertebral body? Again, an artery. Mm -hmm. Could be an artery, or most likely it's a venous plexus uh, in the vertebral body that drains. And just um, this image, not much that's too interesting there. Just more of the same. Okay, now axial cuts. So, um, what is this um, circle in the middle, Aaron? Spinal cord. 
Yeah. And what's this little thing coming off the side? Yeah. Yeah, what's that little piece of spaghetti coming off the side? Um, it's a little spaghetti coming off the side. Can you see? Hold on. Oh, hold on. This thing. A little piece of spaghetti coming off the spinal cord. Nerve root. Yeah, it's a nerve root. So, this nerve root, does it give motor or does it give, um, is it a motor nerve root or is it a sensation nerve root? Dorsal or ventral? The dorsal ones are sensory, sen sensory yeah. So, this gives sensation. So it's about the it's coming together with its brother who's motor, and it goes out the uh, foramen, and it's a motor sensory. How about this uh, circle right there, Aaron? What's that? Vertebral artery. Yeah, vertebral artery. And look at its uh, companion on the left. Bigger or smaller? Smaller. Is that normal? Abnormal? I thought you said left was usually bigger. Zombie. Somebody else told me that left is usually bigger. That's what, yeah. So the left vertebral artery is usually usually bigger than the right. And the and the uh, circular dark areas on on both sides. Yeah. Um. That that's a nerve root, I believe. That's what I thought you were gonna say. Yeah. Mhm. Mm and it's uh, surrounded <coughs> by fat. I've got to lose some weight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got a lot of fat around my nerves. So now we're, we're marching down. You see, the spinal canal is getting the spinal canal now is getting a um, a little bit smaller. And um, interestingly, the vertebral artery is getting a little bigger, isn't it? So during, as a surgeon, you always have to be cognizant of the location of the vertebral artery because sometimes the vertebral artery can be in a bad place where it can be injured during the surgery and usually it's like down here so this is usually where the surgery is which is at the level of the uncus um, so that's at C2, C3 and the spinal canal is getting slightly smaller we're marching down see the spinal canal is getting a little bit smaller and but there's plenty of room for the spinal cord isn't there and you see the vertebral arteries quite big on the left compared to the right and the foramen is a distance from here to here so from the, that distance is the uh, frame and, and the nerve root exits out that <coughs> hole. And if you have a large uncinate process, it will compress that. Hey, Doug, good morning. How to read an MRI. So further down, C3, C4, pretty similar findings. Um, pretty sure the spinal column is getting slightly smaller. Now C4, C5. So most of our motion comes from C4, C5, C5, C6. C6, C7, and this is the area that's uh, usually compressed. And you can see here there's plenty of room for the spinal cord. The spinal cord does assume a slightly more flat shape, doesn't it? Um, the other interesting thing I want to find here is how, how thin the lamina is here. It's all cortical bone. See that? And that, Aaron, I just wanted to point that out to you because we cut through this. And then, Aaron, how come whenever we cut through this, it always bleeds, right? Does it always bleed? Every single time we do this, it always bleeds. But you can't see any veins there. Why is that? Where are the veins on the MRI? Why doesn't it pick it up? I mean, this is a fat suppression image and it picked up all the other veins. Why doesn't it pick up those veins that we always see, right? Every single time. And you always say, you know, you always do this problem. You always make this mistake. You always hit the vein there. And I was like, yeah, it's always there. But why can't we see it? It's flat. It's flat. Yeah, so the vein's a very compressible structure, mm -hmm. and it's very, very flat. And then when we decompress it, and usually we don't decompress normal people, we decompress people that have a problem that are very stenotic. When we decompress them, now the vein, for the first time in 10 years, has a lot of room, and it fills up with blood. And then it's very prominent. So, so, it doesn't, so the MRI doesn't show everything. So this is the next C5, C6. What do you think of C5, C6? Normal, abnormal? It's okay. Mm -hmm. now, do you think that this side is a little bit more bulging than this side? Or no? Do you think this frame in here? Is a little compare to that. The other? Yeah. Or is there just a rotation in the slice? Could be, but it could be slight framal stenosis. In, are you suspicious at C5, C6? Remember we talked about <laughs> the discs? We are suspicious because there's a, so there may be some slight left-sided C5, C6 framal stenosis. 
Now these these images appear a little fuzzy, or sort of like yeah. That would even there, is there any motion artifact there? No, this is this is just a great MRI. It's just really magnified. This is really, I mean, the the resolution. This is as good as it probably gets for the resolution a resolution as good as it gets for a one point five Tesla. Yeah, for a three Tesla, you get better, even better resolution than this. Um. So same finding get C five C six. Anything abnormal C sixty seven here? Spinal canal looks totally normal. Again, the spinal cord has a totally normal shape. Remember, it's it's like it's a cylinder. It's not completely round and it's slightly flattened. And there's CSF anterior posterior to the spinal cord. Okay, we'll go over some abnormal soon. Uh, C7. I just want to make a point of the lateral mass of C7 is really small, and the vertebral artery is here. That's why C7 cannot cannot uh, sustain a screw in the lateral mass, unlike the other uh, levels. And you can see there's not much to put into it, and also the artery is right there. So that's that's the main problem with C7. So in this individual, you really can't put a C7 screw in there. But some people you can. You'd have to put a pedicle screw. And again, the pedicle screw it has to be perfect because on one side is a vertebral artery. On the other side is a nerve root in CSF. So it has to be a, a bullseye, and it's a small, it's a very small structure. I mean, it's doable, but difficult and this just shows you the anatomy of the uh, vertebral artery as it courses over the C1 and it enters the uh, atlanto-occipital <coughs> membrane and it goes into the brain from here so you have to be careful here because when you do surgery at C1 this artery is right can be right there and it can be more medial so as a surgeon you have to know variants of anatomy it, it can be more medial where you can be compressed and so Aaron from your experience the posterior at atlanto occipital membrane, can it be thick and adherent to the dura? Very much so. Very much so, right? That's why it's got a special name, I think. That's why they don't just call it um, ligamentum flavum. Like all the other levels, they call it ligamentum flavum, but um, they have a sp it has a special name. Okay, so any other questions about, here's the, um, if you want to come here, we're going to go in two weeks, you can come with us, bring your kids. This is the balloon glow. You can see the kids run in and out of the balloons. They, they have a great time. And they have different shapes. It's fun. It's at, um, it's at the Howard County um, Fairgrounds. Fairgrounds this year. So any questions about normal anatomy? <laughs> okay, let's, let's do some abnormal anatomy now. Um, so this is, let's start with an x-ray because the first, the first image we usually get is an x-ray just because it's uh, cheap, it's effective, it's easy to get. This is a 77-year-old woman who presented with uh, hand, and she came to me f basically from the ER, so she didn't have a workup, so I found that interesting. She only had x-rays in a CAT scan. 77-year-old uh, woman, hand weakness, hand numbness, ataxia, and she had a prior ACDF uh, um, um, 14 years ago. <coughs> that stands for? Uh, anterior cervical discectomy infusion. So she had an anterior approach and the discs were removed and she was fused here from C4 to C7. So uh, Aaron, what do you see on the x-rays? Do you see anything that stands out? <coughs> on the x-ray? Let's ask Doug. Doug, do you see any? Says Doug because so he won't fall asleep. Doug, do you see anything on the x-ray that stands out? Anything on the x-ray that stands out. Just it looks said. like she has a four-level fusion, which appears to be solid. Right, so if you look at, hold, let's slow down one second. On the CAT scan, you see how it's solidly fused right here? It's could, just one contiguous bone. So surgeons, we always see if the fusion took, and it did. Okay, so solid C4 to C7, it worked. That's kind of the good news and the bad news. What's the bad news? Well, how about just above the fusion? Uh, above the fusion... Um, it does not appear to be fused. It appears to be mobile. Yeah. And it's arthritic. That, it's a, so it's not a normal disc. It's flattened. It's irregular. So she does have some C3, C4 stenosis. Now, is this a normal C2? It's kind of short, isn't it? Usually it's long, isn't it? So it's kind of, it's gone. Where, where did C2 go? Did What's her, is she a rheumatoid? No, no history of rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -mm. So where'd C, Aaron, where'd C2 go? Somebody, did it go for, for lunch? What, what, 
what's she's asking for it. What's above that? Is that the... Uh, what is all that? What is this stuff? Is that the posterior... Um, this is, this should be, I'll show you normals, because I'll show you normal, but the, well, I don't even know what this is. It's weird looking. On the x-ray, you can't even see anything. So she's subluxed anteriorly, it looks like. Right. So what's going on is this person has a, where it's the a skull clivus. meets the spine, yeah. serious problem going on. Is that the clivus? Uh, uh, Bayesian and Episcian disease. I think clivus up here. But I'll, sh I'll show you some more images. So what should it look like? Well, it should look like this. It should be the C2 is long. There should be a C1 on either side. And you should be able to see the frame and magnum well. This is what it should look like. And I'll show you her. I mean, it doesn't look like that at all. So just on the basis of this, are you concerned or like no big deal? Just a little bit of arthritis. It, <laughs> that's always a trick question. Okay, so just I just want to review one more time of, of T1 and T2 images. So really dark is bone, like mineral rich, uh, rich minimal mineral rich tissue or fast flowing blood is always black on both T1 and T2. On T2s you see best water, things that are full of water, like spinal fluid, like uh, the kidneys. Um, CSF, cysts, the bladder. On T1, what lights up is fat, uh, fatty bone marrow. Remember we said the um, uh, cancellous bone lights up well? Um, so bone doesn't show up at all on MRI. It's just black. And that's why cascade is a lot better for any bones. So when you get a cascade and when you get an MRI, cascades are fast, they're cheap. They're, uh, they're, because they're very fast, you don't care if the patient moves or not, like an MRI. It's easy for claustrophobics. It's good for like bleeds in the head, etc., foreign bodies. Uh, the MRI has no radiation, so um, the cascade has a tremendous amount of radiation. You can see more detail with MRIs, and um, you have uh, more uh, planes that you can look at. So now here's the same patient again. And it juxtaposes the CAT scan and the MRI. So, very different picture, right? And what you can't appreciate on the CAT scan that you can on the MRI is the fact is now you can see the spinal cord. So, Aaron, how would you describe the shape of the spinal cord? Is it mm, straight? Is it no, shape? Like hmm? S. Yeah, it's an S. So that's that's a problem, right? So the spinal cord should not have that bend in it. Look at that curved bend there. Yeah, and this this whole thing here in the front at C2, which you can't even see on the CAT scan because there's no bone in it, is just a big glob of panis and synovium and um, uh, cellular tissue of basically the, the you know patient's body. It's in the front of the mouth. Yeah. It's like a transoral. No, that's not what she needs. She. Um, I'll show you what you got. Um, so this this big inflammatory <coughs> process, why does it affect C? Do you know why? I don't know. I'm just asking. Does anybody know why it affects C2? Can you can you guess, Doug? Why does it affect C2 so bad? I don't know. What's with C2? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Does, you know. It just does. Yeah, in some people, not everybody. So just like rheumatoid arthritis affects knees, well, why does it affect know, knees? It isn't the you know, I was always taught that fifty percent of your rotation is, uh, you know, with one level, top level, and fifty percent of flexion and extension on the top two levels. I, I think that's true. So, because I do, the, I do surgery on those levels, and you do lose a lot of rotation when you fuse occiput C one C two. Right. Hmm. So, okay. So, so is this a problem? Yeah, it's a big problem. So if you if you measure this is, I took a picture of this just. Pre-op, I did some planning. I just wanted to measure it so I knew how bad it was. I took a pic. Uh, I actually, I printed it out on the computer and I just cut it out and put it in my. I have like a little book I keep of all my surgeries. So it's 126 degrees, which it should not be 126 degrees. And the other thing I did is I measured just the uh, the skull, like how thick it was, because I wanted to put some screws there. So this is not the this is not the um, purpose of this lecture, but. This is the pre-op and the post-op. So she had a, a, a posterior decompression. So basically, I removed all the posterior spinal structure, the lamina at C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. So all that's gone. 
so all that I removed. It wasn't easy because the, uh, the, the membrane was scarred down to the dura, so I had to peel off the membrane off the dura, which is not easy. But you can see what's, once that, those posterior structures are gone, now the spinal cord drapes backwards and it's normal again. It's, it's got a very slight shape. Um, it's not 180 degrees, it's not straight, it has, usually has a very slight bend to it. But you can see by just by decompressing the backside, the spinal cord uh, floats backwards and has plenty of room and is fine. So you would think that you go through, the problem is going through the mouth, it's, just, it's a very dangerous operation, it's very deep. So did you stabilize it? Yeah, and I did occiput, occiput uh, C7, because I felt I had to... Um, you put screws into the occiput? Yeah, I put like five screws into the occiput and removed C1, C2, C3, C4. So that's huge. When you looked at her clinically before the surgery, was she sort of... No, she's a normal woman. She's a like <laughs> totally normal 77-year-old woman. The only abnormality was she goes, I can't feel my hands, and I walk like I'm drunk, and I haven't had anything to drink. And yeah, she goes, that, That's not really her level for her hands. I mean, she, that's sort of like long track signs, but that's... Myelopathy. It's just, it's just gross. Myelopathies, myelopathy presents very, like, is very subtle. Mm -hmm. So people say things like that. The other things they say is... Uh, Aaron, what have you seen? Aaron said, she said three years of experience. What'd she say? I don't want to do all the talking. What, what do they say when people are myelopathic? Um, we've had like, we've had a string of them the last couple of years. They're off balance. They get they off balance, my balance is off. You um, can't stand right. They say I go to the right or the left. What about their hands? Like electrical <coughs> jolts down their arms. Jolts down the arms. Also, they say they can't button things. They're sloppy. So even they, opening doorknobs. Yeah, doorknobs, jars. They're just regular things. They, they drop. drop their Drop coffee, it's not a big deal to drop a pencil, but when you drop a cup of coffee, it's a problem because you get burnt. So they always say, I drop coffee cups or hot liquids. And it's handwriting. <coughs> Their handwriting goes, gets worse. Hand, yeah, handwriting's worse. That comes from a lot of things, but yeah. So does anybody else want to add any myelopathic signs? Hmm. So, so spinal cord shape is important when you read an MRI. So here's a, here's a night glow at night, it's very beautiful. Okay, so here's another illustrative case. I'm trying to. This is a 48-year-old um, man, so 48 is very young, and he has right fifth finger pain and numbness. So what do you see on the MRI, Aaron? Spinal cord. What's the shape? Is it straight or is it curved like the other woman? No, it's good. It has good shape. Nice it's and great. straight, right? C1, C2 looks totally normal, doesn't it? What about this? Is that normal? That does not look normal. Yeah. So there is a disc bulge at C2, C3. And this little dot here, is that normal? No, that would be... Um, Spinal cord signal change, right? Which is a problem. Uh, and you what also... What did you say? A sp Spinal cord signal change. In the, yeah, the or, signal. Yeah, signal. You can say that, or you can also say myelomalacia. Myelomalacia uh, means, is more like a pathological term. But spinal cord signal change is more just descriptive, because we just see that on the MRI. So he had fifth finger numbness. So. Clinically, he was more like a C8 nerve root problem right down here. That's all he complained of. He didn't complain of any ataxia, nothing. So I wasn't sure if C2, C3 was how stenotic it was because it wasn't a great MRI. So I got a myelogram just to evaluate C2, C3. So here's C2 and here's C2, C3. So C2, C2, C3. So do I need to decompress it? He had no symptoms at all. Then what do you think? Would you decompress it or not? Doesn't look like it. It does not terrible. I mean, he didn't have any symptoms, so I talked to him about it. I said, "Look, you do have a problem real high. It's kind of a big deal to fix, and I don't think that's what you're complaining of." And he goes, "And this guy's a very nice man. He's an army guy. He goes, Doc, just fix what's broken, okay?" So I said, "Okay, that's what I'll do." So. So the um, I just did a uh, C7 T1 ACDF, and he did very very well initially. Pain was gone, and he was very happy. But then he came back a year or two later, and he goes, "You know, Doc, now that you said it, my hands don't work right, and I do walk like I'm a bit drunk, and I'm concerned about it, and uh, it, and I feel like it's getting worse." He came back like two or three years later. So now, what, Aaron? What's causing that? Now, two, three. now I think C2, C3 is a problem, yeah, clinically. And so that's a different surgery than before. 
C5, C6 looks a little yeah, the same movement. It does. Yeah, you're right. So you're right. <laughs> C5, C6, C6, C7 for that matter. C4, C5, small, C3. Not much room for the spinal cord everywhere, isn't there? So so I fixed all of them. I, open, I did a dome osteotomy at C2, decompressed C2, C3. And, and you, the reason why I don't take off C2 is because there's a very strong muscular attachment to C2 that keeps our head up. So if, if you can, it's best to leave it alone so that the patient doesn't head's, head doesn't droop post-op. And then I opened up the spinal canal by cutting one side completely, hinging on the other side, opening it up, and placing these small plates across it. It's called laminoplasty. So I opened up the spinal canal at every level. And you may not believe me. You're like, can you really do this? Well, here's the MRI to prove it. So here's pre-op and post-op, and now the spinal cord's got plenty of room everywhere. So I felt if I was going to do an operation, I should fix them all. And uh, with the laminoplasty, that's the benefit of the laminoplasty is that is that it get, it opens up the whole spinal canal. So it's kind of an extensile approach. You still have that signal at C3. Yeah, and now you can see it better, can't you? So once you have it, I don't think it ever goes away. So he does have some mild uh, malacia or spinal cord signal change. Mm -hmm. um, With the myopathy, are they going to be hyperreflexive, like large thing you That usually doesn't go away, yeah. Okay. So if they have hyperreflexia, it stays for life, even though you remove the compressive lesion, okay. usually clinically. So this patient, unfortunately, did get a complication. His neck lost strength. He also got an infection, actually. Mm -hmm. His neck lost, lost strength strength. I had to take him back and wash him out and he had some mild kyphosis afterwards. You can see here the plate uh, that opens it up. But despite this he recovered and he was fine. Like, and he's been my patient ever since. I see him all the time for like low back issues. He's like a, he has a lot of arthritis. His neck feels great. He's very happy. Um, okay, one more case. is a 47-year-old <coughs> woman with uh, six months of neck stiffness, pain, and left upper extreme paresthesia, the forearm, elbow, hand. So the x-rays, just to move things along because we're getting late, the x-rays show some anterior disc uh, deterioration, like ossifieds, like I had on my MRI, mild, AP films kind of straight. So here's the MRI. Aaron, what do you see here? Anything jump out at you? How about C1, C2, and the spinal cord? Looks okay. Totally normal, right? right. How about down here? Is How's the room for the spinal cord? Not a lot of room. There's not a lot of Not a lot of room. Interior. Right. Yeah. What's that? Right. Note the black line directly posterior of the vertebral bodies and relative thinning of the spinal cord. Nor note normal disc height. That's a little note for you. See all that? So there's blackness there, and the discs are normal. So that's uh, that's uh, abnormal. Shouldn't be like that. Um, similar findings. So at C3, you see this uh, this black structure. Compressing the spinal cord. Well, what's black again? What did we say? What's black? Bone. Hmm? Bone, yeah. Or it could be disc, but directly posterior to the verbal is bone. And C, C3, C4, same thing. And the spinal cord, how would you describe the shape? Flattened. Flattened, no right. Fluid around it. Same thing at C4, C5, flattened. Huh. And just so, so just as this, um, those blocks just kind of describe the shape, if you had to. It's about three to one. So the the height of the spinal cord versus the width is about three to one. It shouldn't be three to one. Um, it should be more like, I would say, you know, two to one or something. And um, similar findings get C4, C5. C5, C6 even, is even more flatter. C6, C7 is small area for the spinal cord. Now this is sort of normalish. This is what the spinal cord should look like, more like two to one. So you can see the spinal cord's flattened. So what do you guys think? Is that a problem if the spinal cord's flat? Yeah. It's a problem, yeah. So a critical problem is five to one. If the ratio is one to five, um, uh, it causes ischemia to the spinal cord. Um, but I think it normally should be two to one, so it's not clear, like you know, what's the criteria for surgery. But I usually use you know symptoms, and, and I talk to the patient about the problem. Um, usually, these types of problems are treated with posterior decompressions or laminoplasties. 
So this is um, this is a young person with arm pain. And what kind of problem is this, Aaron? What do you, what's the abnormal thing? And you can tell it's a young person, right? Because the vertebral bodies good shape are in really good shape and normal and thin, and everything looks normal except for these two things right here and here. What are those two things? Um, are they uh, like osteophytes? No, the discs, disc herniations. Oh, is it? So, yeah, so this is like a young person with two very large disc herniations compressing the spinal cord. So we're wrapping up. So the last the last image is just, uh, I wanted to go over artifact, is this is a patient who's had a laminoplasty and had severe stenosis pre-op, but now post-op is totally normal. See how the laminoplasty can open up the whole spinal canal. And the plates that you see on the x-ray are made out of titanium. And they throw off a shadow, and I just wanted to show you the shadow that it throws off uh, in the spinal canal. Uh, it's black. <coughs> And it looks like the spinal cord is being compressed, but it's not. So anytime we have titanium, like screws, rods, plates, laminoplasty plates, it throws off a black shadow, which is not pressure on the spinal cord. It's just an artifact. Just kind of shows you, you know, what it looks like afterwards. Okay, that's it. Oh, oh you're welcome. Any questions about MRIs, cervical spine? How to look at it? All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah. See you next month. Bye.